Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Houston Methodist DeBakey Heart and Vascular Center Grand Rounds. Uh, we're uh, very excited to have our guest speaker today, but before we get started, I would like to go over some of the usual housekeeping uh, uh, points. Uh, we are would be very interested in audience participation. So if you have questions, please feel free to send them in. You can join by web by going to uh, polev.com, enter DeBakey, and then uh, respond to the activity. Or you can uh, join by text by texting DeBakey at 37607 and then text your message. I uh, look forward to hearing your questions. I'll turn it over to my friend and colleague, Dr. Valeria Duarte, to introduce our speaker. Thank you, Dr. McGillivray. Good morning. We have a phenomenal speaker today, Dr. Karen Stout. Dr. Stout is a professor of medicine and pediatrics at the University of Washington and currently serves as the associate division head in cardiology and service chief at the University of Washington Medical Center. Dr. Stout founded the Adult Congenital Heart Disease program at the University of Washington uh, and Seattle Children's Hospital. She is a true pioneer in devel program developing and also in education of the newer generations of ACHD specialists. Dr. Stout became interested in ACHD during medical school and even though she had a, a variety of specialty interests, she maintained involvement in ACHD throughout her training and then continued to do additional training in congenital heart disease at Seattle Children's after completing her general cardiology fellowship at the University of Washington. Uh, the clinical experience and program development afforded by ACHD program at, at University of Washington has led to many opportunities for Dr. Stout. She is a leader in the field and she's been in multiple leadership roles within the ACHD uh, community and in pediatric cardiology community at the American College of Cardiology, the American Heart Association, the Adult Congenital Heart Association, and the American Board of Internal Medicine. She is the chair of the 2018 ACC and ADHA guidelines for the care of adults with congenital heart disease and she served as chair of the Heart Failure in Congenital Heart Disease Writing Committee. Um, she's on the ACHD Board Exam Writing Committee for the ABIM, and she, al she also served as the in the Cardiology Board of Internal Medicine. Dr. Stout is from the Southwest, and she spends her first time enjoying outdoors in the Pacific Northwest and British Columbia. She enjoys snowboarding, hiking, biking, and kayaking and occasionally stand up paddling board. Um, Dr. Stout, it's such an honor and a privilege to have you here. We thank you for your commitment despite the time difference and we we'll welcome you. Thank you all so much. Um, I really appreciate the really kind introduction and it's uh, a delight to be able to join you. I'll get the screen share going here in just a second. Um, and the opportunity to be able to participate in DeBakey's Grand Rounds and join Valeria, Tom, Huey, and all of the crowd is really fantastic. So as per usual with all things COVID, I am really sad that this isn't in person. So um, I am going to talk a little bit. I'm going to talk about the 2018 Adult Congenital Heart Disease Guidelines um, and sort of reflect a little bit on lessons learned with something of a focus of sort of which things we sort of got right and which ones we didn't. Um, adult congenital heart disease is a little bit like the, um, I don't know, French poetry of our regular campus. It's hard to get disclosures. It's unique. Um, everybody sort of likes it, but throwing a bunch of money at it is not necessarily, unfortunately, where we've been yet, but we're getting there. Um, so I have no disclosures, except particularly given the hour, I may have gone full on Zoom mullet for this, but you'll never know. Um, so I'm going to put this in the context of a patient named Michael. He's a 32-year-old um, with Tetralogy of Fallot in for routine um, ACHD evaluation. Um, he has occasional palpitations. He doesn't 
feel as in shape as BC um, because COVID uh, in the local slang, um, but is otherwise generally his usual self. He had a play like Tausig Thomas Shunt at age six months um, and a complete repair at age two years. He'd been followed by his pediatric cardiologist until he was 18. And when he moved for work, his new primary care provider, having heard um, our various spiels about adult congenital heart disease needing ongoing follow-up, um, referred him to the ACHD clinic. So for those of you who don't remember Tetralogy of Fallot or don't do this all the time, uh, Tetralogy of Fallot is indeed four things. VSD, uh, the severity of the disease is really defined by the um, severity of RV outflow tract obstruction. Um, and then RV hypertrophy is a consequence of those pressure loads and an overriding aorta. So the initial repairs of this weren't actually repair, they were palliative, the Blalock Tausig Thomas shunt of taking the subclavian artery, attaching it to the pulmonary artery to at least give the child some increase in pulmonary blood flow, make them less cyanotic. So all of that is great. Uh, he eventually went on to a complete repair, which includes closing the VSD and opening the right ventricular outflow tract. And here's his echo. And for those of you who read echoes, you'll identify there's a VSD patch here. Uh, in the words of one of my echo mentors, um, you could tell that it's a VSD patch because unlike me, it was bright and thin. Ha, ha, ha. Um, there's also an apical view here showing a dilated right ventricle um, that seems to squeeze okay. Nothing standing out here is particularly terrible. He's got pulmonary regurgitation. Surprisingly, he actually has some evidence of a valve. Um, and the pulmonary regurgitation is something between mild and severe. Uh, PR by echo can be kind of uh, difficult to nail down sometimes. So he has a bunch of questions. Why does he have to get tests? Um, as we start proposing things like MRIs and cardiopulmonary exercise tests, he knows he has a leaky valve. What's going to have to happen with that? Um, is he going to need surgery or is, can he have one of those catheter procedures that his grandfather ended up having to fix his valve problem? How often does he actually have to see us? Um, and now that he has kids and is really thinking about his longevity, is, is he going to live long enough to see his kids graduate from high school? So he has a bunch of different questions and there are clearly options. You can go old school, get on a book uh, up to date is great. Search something on your phone or when life gives you lemons, you can make recommendations or guidelines. And that was obviously the approach taken years ago for setting up the American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology guidelines to help concisely, in theory, um, give everybody recommendations based on uh, a combination of the data and when necessary, um, expert opinion. So um, I'm speaking now on behalf of the Guideline Writing Committee, who are a fantastic group of adult congenital heart disease experts in various different fields, and really um, a remarkable group of people who um, took a big task and helped make it both fun, but also hopefully an effective product. So did we nail it with or both? Um, and I'm going to go through some of the lessons of the whole thing for me me as a practicing cardiologist, adult congenital cardiologist. Um, and I'm going to kind of talk a bit as we go along about process, product, and people, um, and particularly patients and colleagues. So one of the things about this is at the time that I was chairing the guidelines, I had also uh, chaired a scientific statement on um, heart failure and congenital heart disease. And they were very different. So the guidelines process, just to have a brief understanding of what goes into it, um, they convene a writing committee um, based on expertise and you assign author groups. The author groups do a deep dive into the data. You're not allowed to bring, well, this is how I do it. And so that's what we're gonna start with. Deep dive in the data, you create a, these huge data supplements. And then from that, you create recommendations. Um, the group discusses and you ultimately finalize the document. It goes off for review. You get to review it. That goes back and forth for a long time. And then eventually it's published. Um, and with all of this, you're using the format that everybody's familiar with of class of recommendations up there in yellow. Um, and then a level of recommendation aiming for as many level A's as you can and as few um, things that are expert opinion as possible. So as the chair of the committee, what you're trying to do is you're trying to manage everybody's 
uh, conflicts, their opinions, their, if you happen to be an interventional cardiologist and you think everything should be healed with stainless steel, um, that opinion has to be sort of managed so that one voice doesn't drown out others, um, particularly when it comes to the subjective interpretation of data um, or um, being able to really nail down the expert opinion piece. And I think the biggest difference in this compared with some of the other scientific statements or things not necessarily sponsored by the ESC or AHA ACC um, is that it's not just the writing committee. There were 46 official reviewers and 3000 comments reviewed by eight sponsoring organizations. And um, as chair, you have to address all 3000 comments specifically. So there's a ton of feedback in these things before they're um, released. And so they, re they reflect um, not just the writing committee, but that uh, the opinions and the interpretations of data that are also inherent in those who are reviewing the document. And that compares a little differently to the um, scientific statements, which in this heart failure statement, because I was aware of the processes going on, we decided we were not going to put in any recommendations because the uh, scientific statements actually only had four reviewers. And so they're hefty. It's got a great writing group as well. Um, and it really is intended as a scientific statement, not as a guideline. So when I'm reading these things, one of the things I recognize is the expertise in the writing groups is always outstanding. It's the vetting process that's a bit different um, and the process by which one goes through um, developing them is different for guidelines and is very prescribed and really helps me understand when I'm looking at other guidelines. Um, the idea that these have been heavily, heavily, heavily vetted and are supposed to be data driven. So back to adult congenital heart disease. It's the most common type of birth defect for those of you who don't interact with it a whole lot of 1% uh, of babies are born with congenital heart disease and 25% of those have a critical life-threatening defect. Um, so it's actually really quite common such that um, there are a vastly growing population of adults with congenital heart disease. And when you actually look at the field, um, it's a, it is a new field. The first congenital heart, heart surgeries, that wasn't you, but um, has carried forward, um, were actually in, the 19, in 1938. And, and first intracardiac was 1954. For everybody who's used to bypass surgery and valve replacement, congenital heart surgery really was the beginning of heart surgery. Um, the first ACHD program in the US was founded in 1976. First practice guidelines were published in 2008, and then in 2015, it became a more full-fledged specialty via ACGME and ABIM. Um, and since then, we still have uh, 40,000 babies born with CHD. That 11 fellowship spots in 2018 has thankfully increased quite a bit, but attracting people to ACHD cardiology continues to be an effort. And we get some really talented folks, but we need more talented folks. So what does that actually mean and why is it relevant to the guidelines? It's not a problem of children. If you look at the successes of pediatric cardiology, cardiac surgery, which have been profound, um, it's really changed the population of yeah, patients with CHD from a group of children who used to not really survive to adult to a group of adults who now tend to have similar age profiles um, and lifespans as the general population. Um, there are now more adults than children living with congenital heart disease. So if you can think of how the pediatric cardiology and pediatric cardiac surgery programs are um, invested in, and then look at that compared to adult congenital heart disease, we've got some, some room to grow there for sure. Um, and by most estimates, the million to million and a half adults with congenital heart disease in the U.S. Um, also comes along with a dramatic increase in the number of hospitalizations for ACHD. And that's only 2000 data from Going back to 2005, it has steadily climbed since then, and certainly our inpatient and consult service has markedly increased, whether it's procedures that are elective procedures that are urgent or hospitalizations for heart failure. It doesn't really matter. It's a whole breadth. So it's a very, it's a very heterogeneous uh, disorder. Um, and or disorder, it's a very heterogeneous condition. And so it doesn't blend to, oh, there's a million and a half adults with tetralogy of Fallot, and so we all know how to manage it. Tetralogy of Fallot, transposition of the great arteries, Fontan repairs, ASDs, it's all one big bucket. And so trying to drill everything down with data is somewhat difficult. So when we were doing the guidelines, one of the things that comes up as a, did we nail it or did we whiff, is really trying to understand our audience. And understanding when silence 
uh, is worse than actually having an expert opinion. So one of the criticisms prior ACHD guidelines was that um, there was a lot of expert opinion and not a lot of data, and that's because that's what existed at the time. Um, now we have a lot more data. However, we were very selective in, in continuing with some of the expert opinion on the premise that leaving people with no opinion was worse than having an expert opinion. So we need to be able to disseminate this information beyond adult congenital heart disease specialists. So 95% of general cardiologists will see ACHD patients and fewer than 10% of ACHD patients are seen by ACHD doctors in some form. Um, and the guidelines are a frequent reference point, particularly as the formatting has gone to being more portable and more um, easily accessed from phone or internet. So the idea of the guidelines was Yes, we could write this for the ACHD experts, but we really, really needed to be mindful of the idea that it's actually really to help um, general cardiologists and all the folks that aren't cardiologists. And so if I use our experts here at the end, Tom, Valeria, Huey, and we look and say, who's the audience? These folks are going to be like, yeah, ACHD, that's our bread and butter. I hear hoof prints, sounds like a horse. Um, and then there's my friend, Jim. Um, here on the far left, um, who is an orthopedic surgeon who encounters adult congenital heart disease almost never. He does hip replacements. Yet when he encounters it, being able to reference the docu the guidelines, because for him, the hoof prints have definitely, that's a zebra. Um, and then ranging from my internists, OB, ECHO, EP, and chief of pediatric cardiology colleagues, for whom adult congenital heart disease isn't quite so unusual because they work here at University of Washington or Seattle Children's, um, but it still isn't quite a horse. It's that thing in the middle, the horbra, which is this funky hybrid of a zebra and a horse, because of course. So the other thing that we learned and that you can definitely, the, the reviewers got, there was no, gonna be no world where we weren't gonna both whiff and nail it. Um, was ideas about recommendations of who should deliver care. Um, if you look at other guidelines, they don't say that percutaneous coronary intervention should be done by people trained in interventional cardiology. Um, and some of that's because that's incredibly obvious and there are external bodies that are making that obvious. Uh, similarly, a transplant patient is ideally cared for by transplant trained cardiologists. And it turns out the idea of saying who should do things um, was both obvious and yet quite divisive. And so one of the spaces that we wrote a few recommendations on, but far fewer than prior guidelines, was the idea is that there really are not enough ACHD cardiologists. And yet at ACHD centers, such as Methodist, there are better outcomes based on data from Ariane Riley and her group in Quebec. And they were able to demonstrate that as soon as guidelines came out that suggested that patients in Canada should be seen at ACHD centers, they had very uh, discrete ACHD centers, they obviously have universal access to health insurance. Um, they were able to demonstrate that as soon as those referrals really started going um, to the ACHD centers, and then you start following outcomes, the patients in the ACHD centers did better, particularly those with uh, significant disease, um, so moderate or severe disease. So. The idea that we can make our guidelines without any expert opinion is sort of ignoring where these patients are actually seen. And so the guidelines did have a fair amount of expert opinion because of that um, understanding of who the actual audience is. And this actually is relevant to Michael. Um, so for those of you not familiar with the uh, geography of the Pacific Northwest, which I was not particularly until I moved here. I was under the misconception it was relatively close to Canada, or it, we're close to Canada, which it is, but close to Alaska, which it is not. Um, so he actually lives in Valdez. And so for him to get down to Seattle is a trek, um, or it requires a flight, um, which is doable, but certainly in the times of COVID um, was much more challenging. Thank heavens for telemedicine. So what we really ended up saying is that we really need to collaborate in the care of these patients. Um, if you're living far from an ACHD center or an ACHD cardiologist, then collaborating with local cardiologists or local primary care providers becomes absolutely um, 
necessary for patient care. And we wrote that into the guidelines based on uh, Ariane Morelli's data um, and in respecting that most people are not close to an ACHD center or ACHD cardiologists, but then did emphasize that procedures really need to be done by folks with um, expertise, particularly in those patients who have more significant congenital heart disease um, or at least more anatomically um, different types of hearts. So um, the access to care, though, is really, um, that's a burden we all bear. As an ACHD cardiologist, you need to make yourself available to your colleagues, uh, to other providers. You need to educate patients and their primary care providers and their general cardiologists so that they can be experts in at least that one patient, even if they're not an expert in an entire field. Um, the great news between 2008 and 2018, however, is that we've actually learned a lot. There's been a ton of data and from that data, we were really able to have a lot more recommendations that were um, that utilized data rather than um, expert opinion based on the 10 years um, between the two guidelines. And the, the guidelines actually take years to develop. So they are um, done in a format now that should la allow real-time updates um, that are in a kind of piecemeal mode. So if we get a lot more data on how to manage tetralogy of flow in a particular area, you don't have to redo the entire guidelines given its current format in order to be able to um, update that one piece. So we were able to find, we thought a balance. However, we still need more data. There's still a lot of expert opinion and the expert opinion was agreed upon, but it was nonetheless expert opinion. So data certainly helps um, and when you look at the actual guidelines, um, as Tom was saying earlier, they're very large if you get them in print form, and certainly in the pre-PDF form. Um, 175 pages, 179 recommendations. We were told to thin them down from the 2008 version, and that was our thinned down version. Um, the data supplements 200 pages. There's 90 level of evidence C and 88 level of evidence B, so expert opinion or not so great data. And one of our great celebrations um, which didn't come up there, ah, oh, there it is, is that we had one level of evidence A, randomized controlled data, um, and that was not present in the prior trials. And so why would we celebrate that in ACHD? As I mentioned before, heterogeneous field, uh, a lot of different disorders, they do not necessarily um, look a lot like each other. So some of our bigger studies in randomized trials are like 100 people. Um, we don't have the heart failure, 4,000, 5,000, or AFib, 18,000 um, person trials. We have small trials, so to be able to get a legitimate level of evidence A was um, excellent, um, and hopefully we'll have more as time goes by. One of the things we did that was different is um, the idea that one size doesn't fit all. So if we're looking at ACHD, it's been categorized in a variety of ways as as it, shown here, um, based on anatomic class, which makes sense. Um, so a bicuspid aortic valve, PFO, small ASD, small VSD, those should all be relatively simple anatomic defects, and the physiology may or may not be, but the, the anatomically, that's one set of things, versus those of great complexity, Fontan procedure, Eisenmenger syndrome, um, transposition of the great arteries in all of its forms, things like pulmonary atresia, or heterotaxy, which is always head scratching as to what we even mean by that, um, if you are an adult cardiologist who doesn't encounter that very often. Um, and then moderate complexity, tetralogy of Fallot. So let's take tetralogy of Fallot and see whether or not anatomic complexity actually is the best or only way to think about complexity of disease, particularly as we're looking at how do we deliver care? Um, how are we actually, who really needs to see an ACHD cardiologist in person? Who needs to have one integrally involved in all of their cardiac care? Who can touch base and alternate visits between a regular cardiologist in terms of a general cards person or um, an ACHD cardiologist? So if you look at the spectrum of disease, these are three patients of mine, 22-year-old, asymptomatic, normal RV size uh, or function, decent-sized right ventricle, but not um, huge, um, and is completely asymptomatic and doing pretty great. Um, next up, sort of in the middle, is a 40-year-old abnormal cardiopulmonary exercise test, um, wide open PR, a big right ventricle with a diminished RVEF, and then um, a 20-year-old um, who actually ended up passing away at age 24, branch pulmonary stenosis, atrial flutter, a bunch of heart failure admissions, and really bad RV hypertension. So 
they all have tetralogy of Fallot and they are so far from the same patient. And so like any other disease, there's a severity of disease. Heart failure is a great example. You can capture the severity of disease, not just based on the ejection fraction and not just based on the cause of their heart failure. So what we took was the data that had evolved over 10 years. And in addition, the anatomic class added a physiologic state, um, which included New York Heart Association functional class, um, exercise capacity, arrhythmias, some of the hemodynamic sequelae of the anatomic abnormality. And some of those are captured by that great complexity concept. So if you have Eisenmenger syndrome, you have a significant hemodynamic consequence of your VSD. Um, and so we tried to capture all of those, including heart failure, pulmonary hypertension, because there's data for all of them that that influences outcome and influences hospitalization. So we use the things that actually had data um, behind them to create not just an anatomic class, but a physiologic classification. And this was medium controversial. Um, there were some reviewers who really didn't think it added a whole lot. Uh, the writing committee felt very strongly that it allowed us to parse in the U.S. Um, how we could care for our patients a little bit more particularly and a little bit more refined for um, using what is fundamentally a limited resource, which is access to ACHD centers and ACHD cardiologists. So if you look at um, Tetralogy of Fallot again, here's a persistently cyanotic patient. I uh, saw one of those yesterday with refractory arrhythmias, and in celebration of his presumably last Olympics, uh, there's Sean White. Um, all the ACHD community knows him to have tetralogy of Fallot, but some of y'all may not. And he, um, I, I'm going to say that the cardiopulmonary pump run or the cardiopulmonary bypass machine may have made him a lot more willing to subject himself to, to potential harm, hucking himself out of a half pipe, but watching the Olympics was pretty impressive this year. So what we tried to do with that um, physiologic stage was for all of the anatomic um, abnormalities have some degree of, a re uh, not even recommendations, they're not recommendations, they're um, potential frequencies of routine follow-up testing and with whom. And it, it allows you to modify your follow-up based on physi physiologic stage to re respect the fact that not all tetralogy patients are the same and not all of them need to be seen at the same frequency or necessarily always by an ACHD cardiologist. So what did it actually mean for Michael? It meant that those recommendations allowed us to really focus on the idea that we need to be involved in his care, um, but we really need to collaborate with other providers to make sure that we are able to um, end up providing the best care we can for our patients. So does the AP classification actually help? So this is one of the nailed it versus whiff, um, because this is one of the things that I would say, yes, we nailed it and arguably we whiffed a little bit, but that's okay because the whiffing was part of the nailing it, um, which is, does this actually classification help think about patients, help guide insurers, um, or help really risk stratify. And that has started to be looked at. This classification has been incorporated in a variety of different um, studies. And some of them have demonstrated that yes, so in the case of patients with atrial arrhythmias, um, the physiologic classification did predict outcomes. Um, and so it was helpful in that regard. Um, however, these studies from Boston on the right, both suggested that it might not add a lot more than say the individual pieces itself, such as the New York Heart Association class. Um, and it also, interestingly, um, so this study is the one that was, yeah, you know, not so sure that the physiologic class added a lot to the individual pieces. And um, one of the authors of that is actually one of the members of the guidelines writing committee inside of the Boston group. Um, and then the same Boston group looked to say, okay, the physiologic class sort of makes sense, but wow, do we actually all read it the same way? And it turns out the answer is no, we don't. Um, and so there was, even amongst experts, some variability um, in applying physiologic class based on subjective interpretation of what was said. Um, on the other hand, if you look what our group um, demonstrated was that um, pregnancy outcomes actually were um, better predicted by physiologic class. Um, although also clearly well predicted by WHO classification, um, which is designed for pregnancy itself. So growing body of data trying to say, does the classification actually help? And if it does, but not perfectly, what things might make it better? Because those could be added to that classification. Again, the way the process works this time and the reason we redid the entire guideline 
was to put it in a chunk modular format so that individual pieces could actually be um, updated without doing the entire document. And this would be a piece that could be added to, modified, take something away, put something else in, in order to make it a more useful tool. So one of the things about the process is data wins. So when there is data, one changes what you have, but when there is not data, you don't get to just go off willy-nilly and say a bunch of things. So heart failure is really quite common. And one would think that we would have a lot to say about heart failure in ACHD patients. It's common in the world at large. Um, there's, they have even more recommendations about how to manage patients, but they're based on a lot more data. Um, and thankfully, one of the things about ACHD, um, with thanks to Sasha Opatowski for this slide, um, this triangular pyramidal thing, um, which I think really captures the ACHD population, the majority of them don't have any heart failure whatsoever. Some of them have other reasons for heart failure symptoms, such as um, valve dysfunction, arrhythmias, that sort of thing, contributing to their heart failure symptoms or failing Fontans. And the more traditional fibrosis, elevated BNT ventricular dysfunction, is a relative minority of our patients and therefore a relative minority of things we're able to study or give solid recommendations on. So what ended up happening as we looked at this is we had, let's try to go for the data, or let's go to the expert opinion, and this is the expert opinion of dear friend and colleague whose name will remain um, anonymous. Uh, frankly, I mess around. This is an email when uh, um, email about a particular type of patient or a strategy of, of managing heart failure. Mess around until they feel better and their BT, BNP decreases without destroying their kidneys. Uh, which seems very reasonable. I then congratulate myself on my foresight and clinical acumen until they get overloaded again, at which point I blame the nephrologist. So that's one strategy. And frankly, that's, that's a strategy on some bad Thursdays for me. Um, with all due respect to the nephrologists and the audience, ours are used to us blaming them for so many things. Um, and then having to accept that we may have had something to do with the rise in creatinine. So one of the things that came from the guideline process that I did not emphasize in the beginning is that there were two systematic reviews. The guidelines right committee identified help us really do a complete deep data dive um, on two questions. And one of them was, what's the medical therapy for systemic right ventricle? Because this is a heart failure type situation where we really needed data. We really wanted um, to be able to make some recommendations. And specifically, if your systemic pump is your right ventricle, um, is that a situation that we just treat it like regular old LV dysfunction? Or is there something different? And all of us would tell you in clinical practice, definitely something different. Not a lot of data that all the usual heart failure medications work. And depending on whether you're a therapeutic nihilist or not, lots of people don't use those medications based on the idea that there's not a lot of data. Whereas another argument is in the absence of data, you can't just do nothing. And so extrapolate the best you can from what's out there. So part of what we asked was this extremely talented um, group, um, esteemed group to do a, um, a systematic review and Ariane Morali chaired both of the systematic reviews. Um, and they did their work, they published it uh, in parallel to the guidelines and we were able to, they ran in parallel to us but their results influenced the guidelines. And it ended up being that the most we could say for patients with ACHD and heart failure is that an ACHD cardiologist needs to see them. And we need to see them partly for that other reasons for heart failure. Uh, arrhythmias in our patient population have much more impact than might be anticipated um, in terms of their physiology and contributing to heart failure symptoms. So we are much less tolerant and we have data behind it of rate control more so than rhythm control as one example, or how to mitigate cyanosis or this the iron deficiency, for example, um, that can go along with cyanotic heart disease, the heart failure symptoms may actually need iron repletion, in which case the patient will feel quite a bit better. So consultation with both ACHD and heart failure um, specialists is recommended for those people who have heart failure symptoms or severe ventricular dysfunction, and then the uh, therapy can be tailored individually. So despite how common heart failure is, there's just not enough data to make any recommendations and the data has to win. So we can have lots of opinions the way we baked that in and what was the most obvious was use the opinions of your local experts, both heart failure and ACHD. And then our one uh, level of evidence E, our level of evidence A recommendation um, is uh, from 
randomized trials that bosentin um, is beneficial in symptomatic adults with Eisenmenger syndrome. Uh, it's beneficial in improving their exercise capacity, and there is some non-randomized data that is beneficial in improving mortality. So there is our one heart failure related recommendation because um, the symptoms of Eisenmenger syndrome may look a lot like heart failure. One of the other things we learned and on the whiff it, whiff versus nailed it um, is don't stifle innovation. So you can't go throwing things in there that are particularly expert opinion that then make it nearly impossible for people to actually study the question at hand. And a great example of that is DOAX um, in congenital heart disease. So we long have had for Fontan palliated patients, so somebody who only has one pumping chamber, you're going to use that to pump blood out to the aorta. Um, and the Fontan procedure in its different forms allows blue blood to be directed back to the lungs, to the pulmonary arteries directly. Anastomose, the SVC, IVC, directly to the pulmonary arteries. Passive flow through the pulmonary vasculature into your systemic ventricle and pump out uh, to the body. And there have been progressions of that surgical um, procedure, but the early versions of it at a really high rate of thrombus, um, either in whatever your connection was or out in the pulmonary arteries because there wasn't pulsatile flow going out into the PAs. Um, so antiplatelet and anti uh, therapy and or anticoagulation have been a longstanding um, management for Fontan patients that is really idiosyncratic as to what's used uh, largely institutionally based. Um, and there is some data in pediatric patients as to the value of having one or the other, but it's not stunningly clear in an adult whether you need it, who should have it, um, and what type of anticoagulation. So we had a recommendation, but really importantly for this, we had to say direct oral anticoagulants that are unstudied and can't be recommended at the present time. So that's what's in the guideline. It's in the text. It is not a recommendation. What it is most importantly is not a class three harm. You cannot do it. Um, so we called out the concerns but we didn't say, no, you can't based on those theoretical concerns, even though at the time there were some people who were pretty adamant that for theoretical concerns, they should not get used. Um, and so we really go, went back to data wins. If you don't have data that you shouldn't do it um, or that it's harmful, then you probably shouldn't put a recommendation in um, that overstates the concern or risk, but you need to put in something. So what is that generated? Um, there is now data growing on DOAX and adult congenital heart disease. Um, and it is, interestingly, those two studies, different, uh, so far at least, different outcomes. Uh, the first one is the note registry, which is a, an elective registry um, of tracking patients who are on DOAX. Um, and in this case, with systemic right ventricles, and that showed that it was probably a beneficial or at least well tolerated and seemed to reduce risks in a, in a medium term. And one of the struggles for adult congenital heart disease is these are diseases that these patients or disorders these patients are going to have lifelong unless they're transplanted. And so what exactly constitutes short and medium term? If you're looking at heart failure in the original solved um, trials, really high mortality rates, 40% in untreated patients over just three or four years, ACHD thankfully does not have that kind of high mortality over short periods of time. So being able to follow patients long enough to either have mortality benefit or to cut down on events is really tricky. So if you just take all patients with tetralogy of Fallot, you may go 40 years before there's any event that you're trying to prevent. If you narrow it down to the sicker patients based on physiologic class, anatomic class, that sort of thing, you may be able to get more events in a shorter period of time, but that has been a challenge. So the note registry suggests that in different patient populations, they're at least well tolerated and probably well tolerated, probably safe and may cut down on events. However, in this, uh, the group from Germany uh, demonstrated recently that that wasn't the case and that there was some concerns that there was a higher rate of um, adverse events in, in those patients with ACHD. Um, but it's a large patient of all adults with congenital heart disease. So again, narrowing it down to something more specific, we need more data. And so I would say that in expressing the concerns that exist without limiting people from actually answering the question, um, we did reasonably well in that, that thing. Um, the structure and philosophy can force a conflict uh, with beliefs of what the right thing to do is. So if we go back to tetralogy of Fallot, it is repaired but not cured. Um, it is 
a transannual incision to fix it that usually leaves people with significant pulmonary regurgitation, which will cause RV dilation, RV dysfunction, um, and you can have ventricular tachycardia, generally scar mediated related to the VSD patch and the transannular patch. So um, what is the right timing for pulmonary valve replacement to trology of Fallot? How long can we wait to replace it? So it's absolutely an ideal thing for a randomized trial, which is, as you're gonna see in a second, um, impractical. So if you look, um, go replace the pulmonary valve, the RV gets smaller in most cases, albeit not all. Um, and that is beneficial. And we have a lot of data on that, that there's this range of right ventricles that is gonna be um, where you wanna be operating to reduce right ventricular size. Um, and normalizing um, RV EDV, um, if you wanna get it um, down to a normal size with pulmonary valve replacement, don't let it get beyond a certain size. So that is some of the data we have there. So what's the right time to replace it? Um, doing it early, could preserve right ventricular function, normalize RV size. If you did it later, you're not gonna subject um, the patient to the increased risk of endocarditis that comes with having a prosthetic valve. Um, and you're not gonna subject them to an earlier procedure, again, a second procedure, um, because of early valve degeneration. The valves may last 10 to 12 to 15 years, but they might also only last three, and then you're having to re-replace it. So there is this, is this tension between do it early and do it late. And so it's an ideal thing for a randomized clinical trial, and yet it's not really practical. So what do the guidelines actually say? The guidelines acknowledge that uncertain benefit of an early surgery and have a lot to say about this. And this is one place where people got reasonably crabby um, because the recommendations are different than what people do in clinical practice. And specifically, um, they're different in the sense that the usual thing is RV beyond a certain size, replace valve. And in this case, it's the data wins phenomenon again um, of being a little careful what you wish for when you really take the dive into the data. And this doesn't mean that this is static, like this is going to change. So what do we know so far? RVs beyond a certain size are less likely to normalize after a PVR. So there is such a thing as too big. Um, and that there are different sizes, but they generally are in the 150 to 160 mLs per meter squared and diastolic volume. And some argument that the systolic volume is a better marker um, than diastolic volume because the diastolic volume is a little bit more load dependent. Um, pulmonary valve replacement improves RV size. There's data, randomized data, or not randomized data, there's data um, done in systematic review um, that shows that New York Heart Association class, if somebody was symptomatic, can improve and uh, RVEF can improve um, as well. Um, however, PVR has a mort mortality risk, whether it be surgical or catheter-based, they're low, um, but it does exist. And we do not have any data yet to say that PVR improves mortality. There's just none. We all think it does, and particularly in, in certain patients. However, we don't have that data yet. Um, and that made everybody, poor Grumpy Cat, I'm still using Grumpy Cat after all these years, um, made everybody very grumpy that we had to really go by that mortality data. And so what we ended up saying was if they have any of these other markers of badness, so decreased EF, RVEF, even LVEF, although that's more complicated, uh, arrhythmias, or certainly symptoms go replace the valve. Um, and one of the things that we're really trying to consider is if you're doing surgical PVRs over the lifetime of a patient, that's a lot of sternotomies. And so trying to find that balance when there isn't a clear mortality benefit remains one of the reasons to have ACHD cardiologists involved in the patient, uh, patient's care. And one of the kickers in all of this is what exactly is transcatheter valve going to do to impact that lifespan? And those that trajectory. Um, fewer sternotomies, is that less risk? Um, transcatheter valves have a slightly higher rate of, of endocarditis. Um, so how does that balance out? So there's still a lot more to learn, particularly as we incorporate transcatheter technology. And, you know, surgeons are great about doing five, six, eight time redos, but there does come a time where that gets, the risks of that get to be pretty formidable. So how much will transcatheter valve replacements um, impact things? One of our discoveries is that interpretations of very carefully selected language still vary. Um, eggs are fantastic for a fitness diet. If you don't like the taste, just add cocoa flour, sugar, butter, baking powder, and cook at 350 for 30 minutes. 
which sounds perfect to me right now. So the idea of like, we were really specific to say something, but everybody's interpretation ends up being particular to their own bias, their own interpretation of what we said and their own understanding of the data or their patient ended up being pretty striking. Um, and ASDs were one of those. So in the case of Tetralogy of Fallot, the clear thing was we didn't give it a level of one, level of evidence, or it's not a, it's not a class one recommendation for just RV size because we didn't have mortality benefits, but it is a 2A, you can still do it. It's still a reasonable thing to do. And people wanted that validation of a, a class one recommendation, but a class 2A doesn't mean that you can't do it, that it's not the right thing to do and that insurance won't pay for it. So ASDs um, are another right ventricular volume loading lesion um, that cause, cause right atrial and right ventricular um, enlargement that can cause um, pulmonary hypertension in the minority of patients and can cause exercise intolerance. So this is another one where closing ASDs is safe and effective surgically and with catheters. Um, it improves RV size, pulmonary pressures, RV function. Um, and in those patients who are symptomatic, improves symptoms. Um, so then what do you recommend? It can be saying, this is, this is a slide uh, done from a partnership of me and one of my partners doing a team grand rounds where he pointed out, here's what the 2008 guidelines said, um, which is close it if the RA or RV are big, period. And then here's all the words we had to say um, in the 2018 guidelines. And in our case, for those who know me, lots of words is my thing, um, but it was also based on not only the data, but yet another of the uh, systematic reviews. Um, and one of the reasons for there is not a class one recommendation like there was earlier was a intervention versus medical therapy. Um, and it both the systematic review and then when people were like, well, VSD has this, we didn't have the same data. And as people look more and more, and quite frankly, it's that unfair burden put on new technology. The catheter-based stuff always has to prove itself against surgery. And so when you have a lot of catheter-based um, device closure trials and that sort of thing, those are something that you can watch and track, which is fantastic. But it does have data then out there that you can look at and say, well, is there a mortality benefit or not? So again, as with tetralogy, the guidelines, many would say we whiffed because we only put the class one for symptomatic patients who have a functional impairment in some form. But again, we did a surgical or device closure um, that is completely appropriate as a 2A. So people can still do what they were doing before. And even though we were very specific to say why we were making those recommendations, um, that still caused some frustration, um, unfortunately. And we keep coming back to their guidelines, not actually the rules. Um, so if that's the right thing to do for your patient, you should do the right thing for your patient. And then to wrap up, guidelines have limitations. So here's Chris, 35 year old guy. You know, we spent so much time trying to identify clinical situations, make sure that we weren't leaving people hanging without something helpful um, that was truly helpful and could be backed up in some form. Um, and then you get this, he's a TGA patient with a mustard repair. He subjectively has normal exercise capacity, says he can do whatever he wants. And in fact, proved it by riding his bike from home um, to his annual ACHD clinic evaluation, which is cool for somebody who's got a systemic right ventricle. And it's even cooler when you look at where he lives, which is Albuquerque. The dude literally did a two-week bike trip of, it was actually longer than that. It was like 1,800 miles um, to come to his ACHD appointment. And yes, we promptly put him on the cardiopulmonary exercise test just to see how he did. Um, so there is going to be no guideline for some of the things that patients come up with. And so that personalized care, that individualized care, what they want to do, how their disease course goes, what other diseases they get, their life choices, really is where ACHD cardiologists and then people who just know and care for the patients are immensely valuable. Um, and um, that wasn't supposed to be there, but boo hiss for COVID um, as the place that got to do it first. Um, and out of all of this, I also had enormous gratitude for my colleagues and patients. Um, and, and I'll end with, my therapist told me the way to achieve true inner peace is to finish what I started. Uh, so far, I finished two bags of M&Ms and a chocolate cake. I feel better already. Um, finishing those guidelines was fantastic. Celebrating the chocolate cake was great, but seeing how they're actually used and how they play out has been really informative. And I really want to thank all of my colleagues and our patients um, for really being amazing. Um, and with that, I can take any questions. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Stout. That was 
really a terrific presentation. And uh, we, we do have a few questions. And, and I guess the, the first thing I'd like to start with is, first of all, congratulations on the guidelines. Uh, I was just involved with writing a uh, guideline for one disease. And uh, it took us a long time. And there were a lot of meetings and deliberations. I can't even imagine what it must be like to write a guidelines on, on essentially a whole uh, specialty, uh, let alone one disease. That being said, you know, the, uh, as, my, uh, as my aunt used to say, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Uh, and, and that, you know, the intention of how guidelines are written are not necessarily the intention by how they're read. And, right. uh, you know, what, as you know, the Institute of Medicine had tried to do is to differentiate, as you nicely stated, the difference between a guideline, a scientific statement, expert consensus document. And, and they have, roughly speaking, a you know, set of recommendations of how you differentiate that. Just like if you're reading the newspaper, there's the news, there's the editorial, there's the op-ed, there's a letter to the editor. They all have to be interpreted differently. So when, when I look at the, at the uh, ACHD guidelines, I mean, there is a lot of uh, level of evidence B, a lot of expert consensus. And so I guess my question is, how did you all decide whether this should be a guideline or should be an expert consensus document? I, it's, it's interesting. One of the things that the guidelines don't, the process, as you've, I'm sure, seen, doesn't necessarily allow you to have two different um, documents that you're sort of simultaneously doing where you say, this is going to be the guidelines, and we're going to put this in an expert consensus statement. You're tasked with one thing, which is what's in the guidelines. And um, when you are going to do, it was exactly that tension constantly of, if we don't say anything here, and it's nowhere else, are we doing more harm than good? And one of the things that had been different in that 10 year intervening period is if you look at the other ACHD guidelines, there were, there's a lot of education in there. There was a whole lot of, um, here, let us tell you what Tetralogy of Fallot is, how it's fixed, what to expect, that sort of thing. And this did not do that. That was definitely a change in formatting. So I think you're exactly right. Um, there may be some opportunity in subsequent guidelines, and Catherine Otto is one of my mentors and partners here at the University of Washington, and she's done the valve guidelines now several times. And she's actually a big proponent of sort of Wikirex um, sort of process where, frankly, the data is reviewed by non-experts, um, by people who are used to doing data analysis. Mm -hmm. And the data and analysts then generate the recommendation that the data shows, and the experts try to make sure that it makes some sense. So I do think there's a lot of opportunity to change the guidelines themselves. Um, some of the things we chose to leave in there as expert opinion, there's less expert opinion than there was before, which isn't on us. That's um, the strength of all of our colleagues uh, internationally for actually doing studies and generating data, um, was that idea of there isn't another place to look to get an expert opinion, and therefore we're going to go ahead and say something. Um, so we tried to we tried to minimize those. If they were the other thing we were influenced by was anything that was in the 2008 guidelines, we had to have a pretty compelling reason to exclude it entirely. And that document was heavily um, expert opinion because there wasn't very much data at the time. So I do think that subsequent iterations could remove more and more of the expert opinion, either because it gets put in a different place because there'll never be enough randomized data or because there is enough data to then start bumping it up into at least uh, a level of evidence B and really narrow the expert opinion stuff down to the things that really have to be there for which there'll never be any data. Um, and there's enough practice experience to say, yeah, we all agree this is the right answer, those of us who do this. Um, but it is definitely a challenge, for sure. And, it, and we spend a lot of time with the, who is our audience and what is, when is, not, when is silence worse than our expert opinion? And it was a pretty wide ranging group who do not agree on everything. Yeah, I mean, the irony of it is that uh, for some of, the, some of the interventions that are more studied, you'd think that more data would give more clarity. And, and sometimes it's just yeah. the opposite. You know, it, it, yep. it generates all that energy creates heat rather than light. So, uh, mm -hmm. Valeria? Yes. Well, first of all, thank you, Dr. Stout, for a phenomenal, phenomenal presentation. 
very enlightening for sure. Um, as you nicely highlighted, congenital heart disease is no longer a problem of children, and there aren't enough ACHD doctors to treat all the patients of all this growing population, and certainly not enough ACHD centers. So how do we think about it proactively, and, to, and how do we, we try to improve access to ACHD care? Should, should that be addressed? to by the community? Should we start looking yes. into shared care models just to face the future? We yeah, better if we look at one of the benefits of COVID, if it can stay, is telemed. And so I do think a hub and spoke model is utterly necessary, regardless of how geographically dispersed you are. We have a huge geographic area we cover. So um, hub and spoke is utterly necessary. Doing telemed conferences like this incredibly valuable. ACHD cardiologists need to get themselves out there so people know they're a resource. Our general cardiology fellowships need to make sure to get people the ACHD exposure and training so that they're at least familiar with things. And we are actively working to rethink uh, the fellowship training. It's certainly a two-year fellowship made a lot of sense, um, but it is a, it's a disincentive for people to do a two-year fellowship that doesn't end up paying them anymore. It's one thing to do a year of heart failure transplant, but it's another thing to tack on two years of ACHD, especially if you are, as many folks in ACHD are, MedPeds trained and did four years. Um, so by the time you're nine to 10 years into your training, the idea that whatever you're doing doesn't have a, um, an increase in financial um, gain um, and you spent more years as a trainee, that actually is a deterrent for people. So we're actively trying to figure out how we can better encourage folks to do ACHD, but in the meantime, develop partnerships and make sure all general cardiologists and cardiac surgeons and pediatric cardiologists know enough ACHD to be able to navigate to some degree the person in front of them, but have known partnerships. Um, you know, call that person, cell phones available. And I think we all, all of us who do ACHD do that, but we really need to have that be structured better. And quite frankly, it would help enormously if the insurers would recognize the expertise and get patients directed to their ACHD centers in a partnership of care, recognizing that travel and that sort of thing can be super challenging for patients. So you don't want to make it harder for them to get care, but you do want to really have it encouraged that they're getting care in the appropriate expert places when they need it. Yes, def definitely a, cha a challenge ahead and that we should all work together to improve. In the end, it's about access to care for our patients. Um, I'm going to tag along with a question from the audience and then we'll, we'll start uh, closing up. Um, so uh, they are, uh, they're asking for your advice for ACHD trained doctors working in the community rather than large academic centers. Mm. What's your, your advice to those? So first of all, I love, we've, we've been partnered with a couple, one of our first ACHD fellows went into practice um, at, um, for those who know, don't know Pacific Northwest, she was in Bellingham, so it's about 90 minutes north of here and near the Canadian border. Good sized town, big hospital. They do all the cardiac things. Uh, that was a joy to have because it gave our patients who lived up there an ACHD cardiologist who was directly partnered with us. She was not, she had a, um, affiliate faculty position. She had direct paths to referring to us. We absolutely consistently sent, oh, you live near Bellingham? Great, here's the person you're gonna see. Oh, you'd rather go north and south? Great, here's the person you should see. It was such a nightmare when she moved to Hawaii. Um, and so, <laughs> although that made sense at the time. Um, so I think that an ACHD trained cardiologist in practice is an invaluable resource for patients and for their groups. And where we've seen that work really well, and we've had that in several places, is um, to have that person be the local resource, have easy paths of referral, and, had, and invariably they are circumspect about what their group or institution is able to do. And so they'll be like, yeah, I feel fine doing this cardiac MRI. It's a tetralogy patient, you know, RV size and function I'm good with. Oh, but I think you guys need to do this one or the catheter-based procedures or whatever. So I think we need more ACHD cardiologists in practice. Um, I think actually having more ACHD cardiologists as long as they don't get stuck in um, a place where they can't refer to an ACHD center. And we're seeing that around here as the health systems become fewer and more consolidated. One of our neighboring health systems is forcing patients to travel six hours 
instead of across the street um, to get their ACHD care because they're trying to keep them in their system. That sort of thing, meh, um, you got to be the voice in the wilderness against that. But I really, I think ACHD cardiologists in practice doing whatever the majority do and some percentage of the time ACHD is, is actually fantastic and we need more of them, frankly. Well, I think that's a great takeaway message. And Karen, thank you so much for a really informative talk. And we really are honored by your uh, willingness to take the time to speak with us today. And it was a pleasure to hear your insights uh, and learn from you. Uh, so thank well, you very much. And uh, to, thank you guys. to everybody that was uh, watching, uh, thank you for your time and please be safe. Have a good day. You too. Thanks, y'all. Thank you.